bid you a good welcome as we gather to worship this day on this, the second Sunday in September. It is a Sunday that's designated as creation time, creation time one, our first week. And creation time takes us from the current time up to the season of, up to Thanksgiving Day, a time when we can gather to recognize and to worship God in created order to use language and hymns and thoughts that surround that during this time of year as we begin to watch our trees and their changing of the uh, colors going into the fall season. So as we gather in this time of worship, we recognize our world, we remember Jesus Christ, the light of the world. And on this Sunday, we come before our Creator God with praise. Let us rejoice in the fields. Let us rejoice in the forests. Let us thank the Divine One for our many gifts. And we lift our hearts in praise, in prayer, in song. We worship. Let us join in our choral introit from More Voices number seven, Gather Us In. Oh, 
prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, we know you as creator and sustainer of this world and all who live in it. We are surrounded by life and we are related and connected to all the created world through you, O oh God. Loving and gracious God, let us dwell respectfully in this amazing creation, remembering that in this wondrous world we are not alone. We are all part of heaven and earth. We share life with the water and the land, the trees and the grass, with fish, birds, and all of creation, with our human siblings, brothers and sisters everywhere. Praise be to you, God. In gratitude, we declare you are good, and everything concerning you, God, makes it good. Bless us in worship this day. Amen. And I invite us into a time of singing hymn number, more voices, number 30. It's a song of praise to the maker. Spirit, you and I can join our voice to the holy cry and sing, sing, sing to the reading for today from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, 
verses 27 to 38, there is this pivotal, pivotal point in Mark's gospel. Till this point, Mark has focused on the ministry and the teaching of Jesus. Now Jesus turns to face Jerusalem, begins to speak about his betrayal, his arrest, and his death. Jesus asks the disciples who the people say he is. And then he asks them specifically who they think he is. Peter responds that Jesus is the Messiah. However, when Jesus tells them what the Messiah must go through, Peter pulls him aside and rebukes him. Peter's understanding of the Messiah does not mesh with Jesus' understanding of what he must do. Jesus, in turn, rebukes Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan. For Peter doesn't understand that his protest is undermining Jesus. Jesus tells the disciples and the crowd that if they want to be his followers, they must take up their cross and follow him. There was a cost to following Jesus that they had understood to this point. Not everyone would accept Jesus as they had. And as he turned toward Jerusalem, opposition would grow until Jesus' own death on the cross. So let us listen for the good news in Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 38. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And this reading is good news for God's people. May the spirit of the living God be with us today. Amen. Loving, most gracious God, may what is said and heard be in the spirit of you, our living God. Amen. Leadership is a widely celebrated quality in our culture. I guess even more than that, it is much hoped for. We are currently in an election campaign and we are hoping for good leadership in our government. Our educational institutions love to train leaders and to celebrate the success of their alumni. Companies applaud and reward their best leaders whose minds and spirits forge new pathways, sell products, and make tons of money for boards and stakeholders. Leadership qualities like initiative, innovative thinking, risk-taking, and analytical skills fill countless resumes. 
We have a mixed sense of both fear and admiration for out-of-the-box thinkers and mavericks. Just think of Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, and Elon Musk. We know that for all of their business acumen and charisma, they can also be sometimes petulant, arrogant, and over-the-top competitive. We do need these kinds of people to stand ground on important issues, to invent and to dream, to have the guts to forge new paths, to defend their own turfs, and to motivate others. But even leaders need a rein to keep them from veering off into their own uncharted territory. Even leaders need a bit of a, an anchor. There is a real power in words theme this week in the scriptures, and this week's gospel is possibly the most verbally abusive in the Bible. The relationship we see in the scriptures between Jesus and Peter is an interesting one, and I think Mark actually cuts a lot of it out. He's sometimes volatile, often outspoken, occasionally pushy, but Peter is loyal to the bone. He's a rough around the edges character. He's got a fisherman's mouth, a protector's spirit, and an adversarial personality. But as I said, he's also loyal to the bone. Jesus knows this. I think that's why he picked him. Peter is the one who stepped out front to defend the disciples on the Sea of Galilee when they think they see a ghost coming toward them on the water. Peter is the one who leaps at the man coming to put Jesus under arrest, slicing off his ear in anger and protective impulsivity. Peter is the one who pledges to Jesus when everyone else starts to desert him and the others follow suit. Peter is the voice, the leader of Jesus' disciples. He's strong, he's able, He's no doubt formidable, and he's loud. He's the one with the gumption to challenge the status quo and put Jesus' words and teachings into real-time action. He's the one you want out front when you're being attacked because he's a ferocious foe. He's the one you want on your side because he could be an overwhelming force if he's not on your side. He's the one with the body of a bear, the temper of a tiger. But inside, I think he's got the heart of a lamb. He's courageous, he's daring, even impulsive. He's like a bodyguard to Jesus. He's never going to let anything happen to his team or to his Lord. Jesus needed someone like Peter to take the lead among the twelve. He would need someone like this to set the foundation for the early church. And Peter, the rock, would be able to do it. I think Jesus knew that. That's why he picked him. He had all of the attributes of a ferocious leader. But for him to do it God's way and not his own way would be the focus of Jesus' mentorship of Peter from the beginning to the end of his ministry. By the time we see Peter being reinstated by Jesus on the shores of Galilee after Jesus' resurrection, Peter, while still a force to be reckoned with, has gained a humility and deference to Jesus that is instantly recognizable. In our scripture for today, however, we see the volatile Peter, the sometimes out of control Peter, the not yet fully spiritually formed Peter. Instead of defending Jesus, he argues with him. If any of you have tried in the past to argue with God, you know it's probably not your best approach. Although God will always listen to us and can bear the brunt of our tantrums, our lamenting, our anger, it won't affect God's decisions, God's mission, God's love for others, or God's plans. 
The scene in our scripture today begins with a discussion about identity. Who is Jesus, really? Well, Peter leaves the disciples in answering. He's the one in class who always put his hand up first. You are the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one of God. At that, Jesus begins to explain what that really means. It is one thing to have the correct answer. It is another to know what the correct answer means. And Jesus' explanation is not what the disciples expect. They expected Jesus to begin strategizing the takeover of Jerusalem and the fall of Rome, changes in rulership, perhaps even a revolution. What did it mean for him to be the Messiah? They thought they knew. Peter was sure he knew. But when Jesus explained that the human one would suffer and be rejected, then be killed, and then rise from the dead, Peter not only opposed Jesus, but he grabbed him. He began talking down, talking him down, arguing, defying him, trying to correct him. I can imagine the scene. I mean, I think we don't get it in Mark, but I can just imagine this whole scene. How can you say anything like that? Peter may have said. We're not going to let that happen. Most likely said the defensive and protective Peter. Peter. Stop talking nonsense, he may have exclaimed. This is not what we signed up for. Peter may have asserted. Jesus puts Peter in his place with one of the most powerful phrases we hear him use with his disciples. Get behind me, Satan. You are not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. Get behind me, Jesus says. Not in front of me, not in my face, not ahead of me, not equal to me. Peter, you are out of line. Your role is not to lead me. I am your Lord. I am the Christ. Your role is to follow me. Get therefore out from in front of me. Get behind me. Literally and figuratively. Because following me, following me also means getting behind, supporting my teaching, supporting my mission, which is God's mission. Defending my direction and my path and encouraging, not discouraging or disparaging what I need to do to bring God's plan to fruition. In other words, your petulance right now is a stumbling stone to my mission. Wow. Wow. How oh, that must have stung. They thought they had it right. Peter thought he had it right. And Jesus tells him, no you don't. Here's what it is. That shepherd's rod must have stung not only Peter's pride, but his ego, as it does to many people who think they are saying and doing the right thing. We don't hear another word for a while from Peter, who I imagine in that moment realized that he had to consider his error and quietly and humility and deference, he got behind his Lord. Would he, after Jesus' death, go on to become a leader in the movement called the Way, help to establish the spread of the early church he sure did in this scripture today we need to realize that being a disciple is not a simple decision it's a journey of learning and God chooses no perfect people God chooses able people able people with the capacity and the willingness to learn to study to prayerfully consider how to carry on Jesus' mission in the world in a powerful but a loving way. Doing that means to set our minds on the way, the truth, and the life and get behind Jesus. 
get behind Jesus and welcome the immigrant, the asylum seeker, the refugee. Get behind Jesus and the gospel of peace, not war. Get behind Jesus and the dignity, the worth, body autonomy of every human being as bearing the image of God. Get behind Jesus and assume care, responsibility, and covenant with creation as our sibling, not as our subordinate. Get behind Jesus and do the hard thing. Take up your cross and move toward redemption, restoration, and recreation. We're called to set our minds on these things as Christian people. And many people do. For Christian leaders need, in the first place, Jesus leading them. And when we have that, then we are standing with Jesus. For the truth of your word for us, for the creative ability, for action from your word for us, for the ongoing spirit to breathe life into your word, we humbly thank you, God, of our words. Amen. Let us join together in more voices, number 113. Jesus saw them fishing. Thank you.
James chapter 1 says, every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above. When we hear those words from above, we instantly think of God. That means that everything that we do, our generosity, giving of our abundance, is an act of God. So thank you. Thank you for your generosity and your ongoing support of our churches over this long time of COVID caution. And we continue to be cautious. Fill each of us with the hope of a good future in God's love. And by being cautious, being wary of everything that is required of us to beat down this pandemic, we are going to have a good future in God's love. May we give generously to the support of our church and for our mission in this world. And for that, I give you humble thanks. Let us join together in a prayer of dedication. Let us pray. Compassionate God, we pray that you take these, our gifts, bless them, use them, exercise our ministry with them in our churches, in our communities, and within our world. Amen. And our minute for mission this week is entitled, No Longer Asking Where I Will Eat. It is, the story is contained with a picture and also a story in text form, which will follow. Will you join with me in our pastoral prayer this day? As we remember the many who are suffering in our world, as we think about the countries that are facing injustices and all sorts of oppression, especially Afghanistan, as we think about our many indigenous brothers and sisters who are mourning the life of many young people who died in the care of the residential schools. As we remember all of our school kids and university kids and college kids who, and their parents and all those who are back in school, 
studying, learning, being safe. And as I like to say, I like to remember the bus drivers too. And in our pastoral prayer, we also hold in our prayers, our, our God's created order, our earth. The many swings that we are seeing in our weather, which we're hearing from meteorological people that this is the way because of global warming. So our prayers include our thought and process around what can we do to help with global warming? Will you join with me in prayer, which will be followed by our Lord's Prayer in song form. Let us pray. Creator God, we come before you now and lift before you our prayers of love and concern, our prayers of thanksgiving. Knowing you as the one who we think of as creator of earth and the universe, sustainer of all, that divine one that holds it all in precious suspension. All of that is a testimony to you, God. How can we ever contemplate our own short lives among the vastness of the galaxies, the suns and the stars, all of the stars born? And we are on one of those stars. We, we know only one better than ours. Of all the planets formed, of all of them, we've only touched one God, our moon. Well, I guess we've made it to Mars, but we haven't had a human touch there yet. We are in awe of you, God, calling you Almighty One, maker and sustainer of us all. Help us to never lose that sense of wonder and amazement for when we have that, that is the beginning of wisdom. Remind us, God, when our daily lives drag our gaze to what is in front of us, to expand our view to what is beyond us. We hold all of creation in prayer this day, God. We also lift in prayer those who are ill of mind, body, or spirit, those who are in care facility, those who may be mourning the loss of life within their midst. We especially pray for all our loved ones far and near. As we gather ourselves in prayer this day, we bring them, bring our prayers to the words that Jesus taught us to pray as we sing together.
Let's join together in our hymn from More Voices, number 28, God of the Bible. worship this day, go to continue to enjoy the remaining days of our summer season. Go by God's amazing grace, confident that we are grounded in love, love for the earth and for all of creation, 
love for our neighbor and for one another. Love for God, the author of love. We go now to share that love in our world. And may our eternal God, creator, redeemer, and Holy Spirit go with each and every one of you this day now and forevermore. Amen. Sure.